I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. Your father, Lucian Carr, was... um, Kind of, I don't want to say the founder, but sort of the glue that held, at least initially, the, the whole beat movement together, right? He introduced Jack mm-hmm. Kerouac with William S. Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg. They all kind of were a team and his, at Columbia. And then his murder case, he killed a stalker that he had that had been abusing him since he was a young boy. I made this famous quote that, you know, I could have been a serial killer. Would say everybody snatched out of it and then, out of context, what I said was, you know, if three or four things more had gone wrong in my life, it's possible it could have happened because I had some of the precursors. I loved starting fire. I set my house on fire when I was four years old. The one thing that I would say that always saves me in any situation is the one thing I am addicted to is learning. I love learning. Forgive me for the question, but would you consider yourself having sociopathic tendencies, maybe functional sociopathic tendencies? Um. Caleb Carr, I have to tell you, I don't want to make you nervous. You're probably one of the smarter, if not the smartest person I've ever had on this podcast, just to put you, make you nervous right (laughs) off the bat, okay? So I have Caleb Carr with me. You've written five Huge bestsellers. I probably read the first one, The Alienist, over 20 years ago. Is that right? And published in 1994. 94, yeah. And uh, your your most recent book, Surrender New York, has just come out. Because when this comes out, that'll be out. And uh, I want to talk about that. But really, this podcast is all about how someone becomes, how someone achieves peak performance. And you've uh, kind of achieved peak performance in so many different areas. There's fiction. There's nonfiction. There's military history, there's criminology, there's a, a billion different things. So I kind of want to weave in and out of all of these, if that's okay. But we're gonna we're that definitely I'm, gonna touch on Surrender in New York, your most recent I book. I am fine with all of that. So so with the alienists, well, actually, I want to figure out how did you get from you you studied military history, you you've written books on military history, you've written books on terrorism. In fact, I read an article you wrote in August of two thousand and one, which kind of predicted. Yes. What was going to happen a month later in 9-11? Like, I have a line outlined where you basically said, 
doesn't matter how many, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but it doesn't matter how many military weapons you have or shields you build, somebody's going to figure out a way through. Right. And that's, of course, what 9-11 did. And then you wrote a history of terrorism. This has nothing to do with all of your major bestsellers, which is what you're most known for is The Alienist and The Angel of Darkness and all your fiction books. But uh, where, where, how did you go from military defense to, well, actually, before I get to that question, I know you advised the Department of Defense at one point. What did you de- advise the Department of Defense about? Well, there's a limited amount of that I can talk about. Um, I just, no one's going to know. We'll just talk about it all here. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, it was be- the beginning of the War on Terror, which they called the War on Terror, which I, I insist be called the War on Terrorism, because they're not the same thing. Um, and there were a lot of people in the military at that point who were who were kind of as there still are, who were agitating for it, for it to be called the war on Islamic extremism. And I was basically trying to give them historical lessons on why that was a terrible idea because the minute you brought Islam into it, all American Muslims, who had been a huge help before and after 9-11 um, to us, were going to feel it was an attack on them uh, the rest of the Muslim world that did not have anything to do with terrorist groups was going to feel it was an attack on them. I mean, there's a lot of the Muslim world that when they hear Islamic extremism, it kind of stops at war on Islam, you know, and it's too close. And so I was talking to them about that. I was well, why t- wasn't that obvious? And I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm a little bit of an interrupter. That's okay. I get curious. Why wasn't that obvious to all the people who dedicated their lives to fight? Like you were a novelist coming in in 2003 to give them advice, but these guys had dedicated their lives to Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, the war in Afghanistan, 9-11. Why wasn't that obvious to them from a, both a propaganda standpoint and, and from a military standpoint? You would be astounded how poorly prepared in terms of Islam our armed forces were going into both Afghanistan and Iraq. The level of um, ignorance was astounding. And yet, you have also written recently, uh, and I don't mean to dwell on all these topics, I I do want to get to the fiction, but you also wrote recently that France should follow our model when fighting against ISIS. Well, that was the other model on Afghanistan. That was the other area of of advising that I was doing, which was um, in the beginning, before 9 11, even, um, Donald Rumsfeld, who's now a dirty name, um, but he was a big hero back then. You know, after 9-11, he was the guy everybody was looking to because everybody knew that Bush was the, a monkey in the White House and that Cheney was living in a hole in the ground somewhere. So, And and Rumsfeld was digging people out of the Pentagon and seemed to have a firm grasp on things. He was a public face of the government. Uh, everybody loved him then. But I had been... Um, in supporting his program to strip the military down, in a sense, to not strip it down, I shouldn't say that, refocus it on the kinds of weapons, platforms, and uh, military groupings that would be most effective at fighting terrorism. That's what he was trying to do. Um, It was a huge fight. Get rid of all the fat that was going on, get rid of unnecessary weapons. So there was a lot of that in what I was talking to the military about. Um, And there was... uh, Is it possible? I mean, as as terrorist groups have more and more technology to essentially touch us and to cause terror, do you think ultimately it's it's a hopeless cause. Like, ultimately, there's no way for the U.S. on U.S. soil to go way beyond 9-11 in terms of what kind of attacks you we're going to happen. You here. can never be safe. I wrote an entire book about this with my with my former mentor and very good friend, lifelong friend, James Chase, called America Invulnerable, which we were talking about. It was a what Alexander Hamilton called a deceitful dream. You can't, you cannot be safe. Um, you cannot be safe from sneak attacks. You cannot be safe from, you know, somebody's always going to find a way if they want to do it badly enough. But you can be sensible about your responses, about how you prepare. Um, Rumsfeld was trying to do that before the war. Um, he went astray, unfortunately, during Iraq. Um, but the but the main thing is 
it's 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 controllable, but not. We can't exterminate it. No, but it can be controlled. Just look what happened last week, which is underreported, of course, because we're all talking endlessly about every idiocy that comes out of Donald Trump's mouth. But um, our special forces and airstrikes, working with the Shiite militias and the Kurds and the Syrian rebels, um, last week closed off two of the big cities that ISIS has been funneling terrorists out of. That kind of thing is huge. That got one story in the Times disappeared. I didn't even know about it. Yeah, it was a, it was a huge story. So, so, so why was it huge? Because now these terrorists because, have nowhere to go. Because they can't fly people out of their territory. Mm-hmm. You know, they can't. They they have only one way to do it, and that's to sneak them out through these large refugee groups that come out. And um, if you close those cities off and control the flow of refugees and check everybody. At that point, rather than when they get here, um, your chances of really slowing things down or or close them off altogether for the time being until ISIS is finished, um, which ISIS is a lot closer to being finished than people think. Hmm. ISIS is in real trouble. Um, Whether the Obama administration stumbled on the policy that they're pursuing right now or whether they did it deliberately, who cares? Right now, they're pursuing the right policy. And everybody who wants, all the people who are crying out about boots on the ground and let's, you know, we need to bomb more and blah, blah, blah. It's going to take time to kill ISIS. It takes time to solve these problems. It always has. There's a, this has a long history. Um, you know, it, we, were, we were in the Philippines for a long time before we got that situation under control. We were in um, a lot of places before we got similar situations under control. We, you know... Do you have faith we'll get uh, this situation under control? Yes. Hmm. I do have faith we'll get it. Why is that? Like I say, under control. We will not eradicate it. There will always be, A, there will always be somebody who gets through, and B, there will always be these lunatics who go out and, as in San Bernardino, as in Orlando, neither of which I consider a terrorist attack. These were... These were crazy people who would have done what they did anyway. And when they realized they were going to die, they said, well, I want to give my life some meaning. So at the very last minute, they say, I am acting for ISIS. And, of course, ISIS is happy to claim credit for everything. Well, what you just said there actually does tie into your fiction. Even though you have a, even though your main yes, fiction is never tied yes, into does. military history, really, or you know, maybe a tiny bit, but... Uh, the idea of violence with purpose as opposed to violence justified, I think, is a strong running theme through all your fiction. That's right. And so I want to get to that. I want to weave into that. You, The Alienist came out. You were probably close to 40 years old. I don't know, 38, 39 years old, something like that. I was 39 the year yeah. it came out. Yeah. So, so where what what were you up to? <laughs> what were you up to before then? How did well, you here's what happened. Fiction? Nobody remembers that the first book I published was a novel. Thankfully, 1980. 1980. You and what's great is I just want to say what's great is if you look for the if you look for the book on Amazon, which is not so easy to find. If you look for the book on Amazon, you are the first review, and you're basically saying this is this is nonsense. <laughs> yeah, don't buy it. You because gave it like two stars. There are book dealers out there selling it for huge amounts of money because there's only about a thousand copies of it out there, and they're selling it for huge amounts of money, saying this is Caleb Carr's first book, and. I'm telling people, don't spend the money. It's not worth it. Um, so, it, it, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a badly flawed young man's novel. Like many first novels. Yes. I mean, you wrote that when you were. I had what, the, like, but I had the good. Years old. I had the good fortune. I didn't think so at the time, but now I realize the good fortune to have it sink into obscurity, unlike some people's which get celebrated, and then they're trapped. Um, So I had always wanted to write fiction. But here's the problem. I I wanted to write fiction because I wanted to find a vent for the things I had experienced myself as a kid, the violence I had experienced, the violence I knew others had experienced, um... You know, it's a funny thing about abused kids. They all find each other without even talking about it. Huh. You suddenly discover that all your friends are have had similar kinds of abuse. 
um, and you didn't know it. You're friends for years, and you didn't know it. Um, they it, it, they seek their water seeks its own level, and so do abused kids. Um, I, I, so, I want to add too, like your your father, Lucian Carr, was. Um, kind of, I don't want to say the founder, but sort of the glue that held, at least initially, the, the whole beat movement together, right? He introduced Jack mm -hmm. Kerouac with William S. Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg. They all kind of were a team and his, at Columbia. And then his murder case, he killed he killed a stalker that he had that had been abusing him since he was a young boy. Um, his murder case was the thing that gave them not only really stuck them together because they all stuck together during that case but also it gave their movement a kind of darkness and gravitas and 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 mystery that it wouldn't otherwise have had so right uh, because you wouldn't normally think of a bunch of uh ivy league students as right. these rebels of society but then right. suddenly they became, became right. that with on the road howl naked lunch right well so my on. father gets arrested for murder uh jack gets uh, tarek is arrested arrested for accessory because he helped them hide the weapon um and then not turn himself in immediately and so it it uh it really was the the sort of and, and then Burroughs, of course, ends up shooting his wife right. down in Mexico. I mean, murder was a big part of their ethos, um, which not not enough people pay attention to because their writing alone still probably would have been important, but it attained this kind of mythological importance because there was real darkness and real violence behind it. Do you think? Do you think many art movements and literary movements? have kind of a mythology also propelling them like you kind of have the 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 brat pack of like the late 80s with jay mack and ernie brett easton ellis tamma jano it's sort of this kind of well wealthier or getting wealthy manhattan fueled by wall street money that kind mm -hmm. of propelled this sort of cocaine filled fiction sure you know of young of young wall street brokers and so on right. and so that also had its own mythology of which I was notably not one on purpose. <laughs> um, you were kind of like the in between generations <laughs> yeah. on that because you did 1980 and then well, 1994. Also, I, I, I also didn't want any part of that. Um, that was what I didn't want to do. Right. I knew that. I didn't want to do that. Um, do you think your fiction, though, was a way to show almost a way? to kind of one-up your father in the sense that he didn't go on to become the novelist that Jack Kerouac and William S. Burroughs and so on did. I never, I never looked at it that way. For me, it was just a way, I needed a way, to, I needed to find a way to write about my own experiences that was not direct memoir hmm. or roughly paraphrased memoir which was sort of what all those guys were doing. Right. You know, they're basically writing the story of their lives, changing the names and some of the circumstances. I didn't want to do that. I had done it in my first book. I'd found this experience ex incredibly creepy. Why? Um, it, it just was um, the kind of exposure it, it lent was, um, it was weird. I, I don't know why. I'm a very private person. And I don't like that kind, that level of exposure. I always want a bit of distance. Um, and I know we'll get to surrender later, but surrender is probably the most personal thing that I've written since then. In fact, it's the only contemporary novel since right. then that you've written. That's so, it. so we will get to that. We will get to that. But the alienist thing was, I was sitting around thinking about how can I write about childhood violence and overcoming childhood violence, and people who fight childhood violence, and people who submit to childhood violence. You know, I had this idea, well, what about two people from similar experiences? One's a, one becomes a psychiatrist, one becomes a serial killer. Um, and show the two ways that it can go, because it, it's, it's only a few steps between Kreitzler and the, and the serial killer in the book. And in real life, that you know, I... We're talking about Stephen Dubner. He he the article he did in New York Magazine years ago when the aliens came out. I made this famous quote that you know I could have been a serial killer. Which say everybody snatched out of it and then out of context. What I said was you know if three or four things more had gone wrong in my life, it's possible it could have happened because I had all the 
so I had some of the precursors. Well, what, well, okay. So tell me the tell me the precursors, and then tell me the skills required. Not that anybody should go out and become a serial killer, but I think that fuels the fiction. You have to know, and it kind of helps understand yes. what's the level of research, both research and internal research it takes to write these characters. Well, there's always childhood violence. That's always the that's always the immediate thing. Do you think that's the case childhood with every abuse. serial killer, like David Berkowitz, Son of Sam, for instance? We've we've found it to be true with everybody in some level, whether it's a, whether it's intensely emotional or f- whether it's outright physical. It's something that makes them feel outcast. That makes them feel abnormal. Um. Then you get into things like starting fires. I loved starting fires. I set my house on fire when I was four years old, um, which did it did was it the burn only down? which uh, I set my bedroom on fire. Okay. Um, and the it was the only time that my father didn't hit me. He mm-hmm. because he came in, he tore up the floor. I've been dropping matches through a knot hole in the floor, and finally caught and it went up. Um, the floor went up. Just that room, they caught it in time. And um, it was the only time he didn't hit me. He took me into his bedroom, and he just sat me down, and I thought, oh, my God, now I'm really going to get wailed on. And already at four, you had that realization that abuse was a common thing in your life. Oh, my God, yes. Hmm. My father had been after me since I was two. When I was two years old, my father announced to my mother, I've got to get Caleb before he gets me. Hmm. Now... That's a crazy thing to say. That's a hell of a thing. But it, he was he was projecting himself and his own experience onto me, and he saw a, something in me that was similar, and he thought that I saw into him too much. I was precocious. It was true. I asked a lot of questions. I talked early. I asked a lot of questions, and he didn't like that. He didn't like to be asked questions. Um but he didn't hit me. He just sat me down and said, why did you do that? And in my head, even at four years old, I'm thinking, why in God's name do you think I did that? <laughs> but I just sort of shrugged and said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was my outward response. And and what is it? Is it a... Is it a it's rage. Cr- it's, it's rage. Ju- it's is just it a cry rage. for attention a little bit? Like It's a cry for, it's a cry for help. Mm-hmm. It's rage. Um, so those are two of them. And then... But then we get into other things. Um, there's you. There's violence against animals, which is a big precursor. I loved animals. They were my only escape as a kid, particularly cats, obviously. Um, and you find someone, eventually, if you find someone who kind of takes you under their wing and says... You know, somebody close to you that says, leave this kid alone. You know, he's he's got something. And for me, that was actually my father's mother, my grandmother, who um, consistently sort of rescued all three of us, me and my two brothers, but especially me, out of bad situations. And um, that was the first enormous help. And then later, it was my friend James Chase, who I met when I was about 10 years old. And, and I was already interested in stuff like military affairs and stuff, which, which drove my parents crazy. Um, but he said, no, 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 leave him alone. This, this is really interesting. I haven't seen a kid interested in this kind of stuff in a long time. Let him do it. Let him do it. So, And we became fast friends for the rest of his life. He died about 10 years ago. Um, and... What are the what are the precursors in terms of let's say the technical skills required for that you see in serial killers? Because obviously, well, a the, lot of that comes to, from violence towards animals, mm-hmm. um, the kind of torture of animals. It's not it's not violence towards animals; it's torture of animals. Mm-hmm. That's the that's where they get the 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 inurement to cries of help. Mm-hmm. That's where the sociopathy really starts to play in. Because if you can torture an animal and ignore its pleas for help, there's something already ve- gone very, very wrong. Mm. Um, so that's why it's such a huge one. They look for that really closely. And 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 do you, is that sort of the difference between? I mean, I've seen you write about the difference between serial killers and spree killers, the mm-hmm. ones who like will, will exactly kill a right. bunch of people in a short period of time. Is exactly that like right. a big difference? It's a huge difference. Mm. Spree killers is much more burst of rage, 
Um, they don't necessarily have any of those precursors. There's no. There's not necessarily as much or any planning involved. Uh, some of them have very, very scant planning. When, when uh, back in when Andrew Kinnanen was on his spree kill that ended up killing Johnny Versace, um, everybody was talking about there's a criminal mastermind loose in the loose in the country. And I wrote an op-ed piece at the time and said just. Just slow down, guys. This guy's not a mastermind. He's stealing cars and killing people. You know, that doesn't take a lot of brains. It's like it's like the old saying about being on Wall Street. If all you care about is making money, it doesn't take a lot of brains to make money. Um, if all you care about is killing, it doesn't take a lot of brains just to kill. Just to, you know, it, it's, it's how you kill. It's the level of premeditation. It's the level of torture. It's the level of... You know, things like imprisonment, things, um, these are all hallmarks of serial killers in particular. Um, and why Why is, like, the imprisonment, the torture, uh, the ability that's to the, not get caught? Also, if you're putting that much planning in, there's more layers in which you can get caught, I would imagine. So, so what? Because you're tempting fate. You want to get caught. Serial killers almost down to a man, and they're usually men, but there's a lot more women than people think. Um they want to get caught. Uh, that's why, you know, the classic thing about serial killers writing to the press and saying, you know, stop me before I kill again. They're actually saying, stop me. You know, I'm not in control of myself anymore. Um, they Most of them are experienced tremendous the psychological studies that have been done. Um, David Abram Hemsen was a great psychiatrist from Sweden who came over here long, long time ago. And he he was one of my mentors on this subject because he did the things like the Sunday... He was the guy who called Berkowitz sane because Berkowitz started getting on the stand and saying, you know, I've been hearing voices from the dog next to the Sam, the dog next door. And um, they had batteries of psychiatrists coming in saying, this guy's crazy. And, and Abramson just got up there and said, no, he's sane. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he's fooling you all. Mm. And thank God the judge believed him, and um, shortly after he went up to um, wherever they sent him, either Attica or Danamora, um, he sent Abramson a letter saying, I'd like you to come and visit me because you're the only one who saw through my act, you know, and I want to tell you the truth of my story. And then he wrote, he wrote a book about it. His actual story, which is an awful story of many different kinds of abuse. So all of these things you looked into when preparing The Alienist, which just mm-hmm. to, to set the stage, this took place in 1896, mm-hmm. so it required an extra layer of research about New York in 1896 when Theodore Roosevelt was the police commissioner and right. you know, all the different... Uh, I mean, you're so detailed on block by block. Like you, it was as if you're there in New York City in 1896. And I live exactly in the area as you were describing. Right. Uh, and so I was just thinking, so did that's I. right here. That's right so here. So did I. So it was, it was just beautiful. I grew from that up point in of those. View. I grew up in those neighborhoods on the Lower East Side. Um, that was not hard for me. Um, and also, there is this thing called the New York City Archives, where you can go and you can find out, you pull out drawers and drawers of maps, and you can find out exactly what was on every block during every year. But why, but why did you decide to make your, you know, your first big attempt at historical, or at fiction, after this first okay. kind of... Why did you decide to make it historical, which adds this extra layer of complexity? People, people, that's interesting, because people always think I chose the time period first, and then chose the story, it was the reverse. I had the story of the psychiatrist and the serial killer, this kind of dual life and going different directions. And I thought, all right, well, a lot of people are writing serial killer books right now. What can I, what do I have special to offer? And I thought, what are you trained as? You're trained as a historian. Go ahead and do it as a historical mm-hmm. novel. And as a historical novel, it, um, you start to look for a time period. And I wanted to go back as far as I could where they could reasonably know the things they knew and draw the conclusions they knew without it being far-fetched. It had to be credible. I found out that the the, the 1890s were really about it, and then pieces started to fall into place. And when you write historical fiction, 
really any fiction that involves research, but but uh, particularly historical fiction, when pieces of research start to fall in place, um, you know, Theodore Roosevelt being police commissioner, bingo. Uh, bingo I'd, because that's a great character. Because I would a... studied him my whole life. He was, okay. one of my, he was one of my great heroes as a kid. So, bingo. William James just set up the first psychology lab at Harvard. Bingo. Loved William James. Um, all these things start to start to fall in place, and you're like, okay, uh, this is where to do it. And also, I want to, and this this is where, and again, we'll we'll get into Surrender New York, your your latest book, in a second. But you also went back far enough where we're not going to get confused by DNA analysis and modern forensic analysis. You're able to kind of get to the pure sleuthing and the beginnings of. Psychi- psych- psychological profiling of a killer. Yeah, and but there's also the beginnings of of criminal science, of what was then criminal science. Um, and one of the big points of surrender is where it all went wrong, where it all went cockeyed with the science was when criminal science became forensic science under J. Edgar Hoover mostly. And that's when it started to serve the state's needs of prosecuting. And you, once science is, pros, is prostituted to prosecution, you're going you're gonna to get a lot of results, but there are going to be a lot of bad results, and that's what we've seen. So, 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 th- so that's interesting. Once science, I love that line, once science is prostituted to the prosecution, you're mm-hmm. going to get a lot of bad results. Mm-hmm. I want to I wanna hit that in, in one minute, but I also want to just ask a totally naive question. The Alienist, first novel, major... Huge, huge bestseller. Plus, the Angel of Darkness. Your 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 next book after that, or your next fiction after that. Um, what? How did you know? Or what? What are the basic plot points you knew you had to hit in a thriller? And I know that's a totally naive question, but I'm just curious. All I knew that you had to do was keep the book, keep the book moving. Keep keep. All I basically knew it turned out how to do was cliffhangers that's all i really that's all i really could figure out it did, i knew nothing about it going in it just it just happened um but i did i i you know and i you had read like a thousand thrillers before then or because you no, your background was military I read, history i read virtually no modern fiction i re- read virtually no modern fiction all of my as as is reflected in all my fiction right up to surrender um all of my training and interest was in 19th century fiction. So, but what I knew from Charles Dickens, what I knew from Edgar Allan Poe, what I knew from Wilkie Collins was that you had to always, you know, no matter what you were telling people, you had to end chapters on a moment where people said, oh, come on. And so did you, uh, and again, naive question, but did you outline them all in advance, or you're writing the chapter and you say, "Okay, yes, what's a, the next cliffhanger?" There's a, there's a famous story that 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 Stephen told in the New York piece about my entire living room of my apartment, my little 700 square foot room apartment on on Second Street between First Avenue and and uh, and uh, Avenue A was covered in uh, index cards, post-it notes. It was just it was insane um, because what I learned was what was insane about it was, and but I still do it. I still plan it out like that. But what you learn is if the characters are any good, most of that's going in, you know, the trash can because once they once they get going, they're in control of the book. Hmm. You're just channeling them. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Main. That's M I Z Z E N and Main. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes. I'm tra- I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half, and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. 
As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a mizzen and main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmaine.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James, that's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M I Z Z E N and Main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like. I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of Prize Pick's favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his? You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. 
And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor, you get all 180 plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. I know a lot of authors go back and forth on this. Some say the characters take control. Some say I'm always in control of the characters, but you're more on the side. If these characters are good, if they have life in them, you'll be writing along and suddenly you'll realize, oh, yep. they wouldn't do this. That's on my index card. They're going to do this. And then how do you say, okay, well, how do I get to the cliffhanger? You just have to. You just have to find a way. And sometimes it takes a long time. I mean, sometimes you really have to stay up nights at a time just figuring out, how to, but how do I get them there? I mean, Angel of Darkness, by the end of Angel of Darkness, I was like, I don't know how to end this book because I've created a villain that's too smart for these guys. <laughs> and um, I thought about it and thought about it. I was like, who, who could possibly come along and help them you know, realize the result. They knew what they had to do, but they couldn't do it because both the police and the gangs in New York were against them. Who could you possibly oppose them with? And I thought, aha, my old friend Theodore Roosevelt mm -hmm. and the United States Navy. And um, that was a wild scene that just came out of nowhere. And um, it was fun to write. Um, I hope it's fun to read. I had a great time with it. That the bunch of Navy guys landing in in early patrol torpedo boats on the Lower West Side, basically going to war with street gangs in Greenwich Village. Um, that was that was how they got to her. Um, so, that's so, you find ways. So now was so you wrote this. Um, historical fiction it was it was heavily researched great thriller lots of things happening um was it hard to get it published that first one was it did, well, did you get rejection there's a big secret about the alienist i sold it as nonfiction. really i had just written a biography of a 19th century soldier of fortune in china um that had been very well received and my editor, Ann Godoff, at the time at Random House, wanted me to keep writing military nonfiction. And I said, I, I want to do this thing slightly different. And I wrote up the proposal. And we didn't have Photoshop then. So I mocked up and Xeroxed several times over a picture of Theodore Roosevelt at his desk in the White House with somebody that I thought Chrysler would look like sitting at the, I, I inserted him sitting at the desk with him. I put in a phony caption to go with it. Um, I wrote the whole thing up as not saying it was a novel, gave it to my agent, Suzanne Gluck. She was fooled. Who, who by coincidence I just had lunch with last Monday. Right. She was fooled. She thought it was, she thought it was a true story. <laughs> and I said, uh, it's not. I have to write it as a novel. She said, why? It's such a good story. It's such a good true crime story. I said, yeah, but I, I made it up. So wait, had she already sold it by that point? No, no, no. Okay. She said, okay. And I said, and I want to tell you something. I want to go to Anne and not tell her either. So we went to her. We gave her the proposal. She read it. She 
totally bought it as nonfiction. She said, fantastic, we'll do it. It's a great story. Um, I said, yeah, but Anne, I have to write it as a novel. And she said the same thing. Why, why, why? It's such a good true crime story. I said, yeah, but I made it up. At that point, I thought maybe I had crossed the line because Anne, although she's very even-tempered most of the time, she has a temper, and she will she will let it loose sometimes. <laughs> and, and she thought about it for a few seconds, and all of a sudden she slams her hand down on the desk, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm in for it now. And she said... Wait, isn't that funny... Just like when you were four and you thought you were like, oh, right. oh I'm in for it now. I'm in for it now. <laughs> she slams her hand on the desk and I figure, oh, God, this is the end of it. And she says, okay, we'll do it as a novel. Wow. So what if they had just thrown you out? <laughs> it was the gamble I was willing to take. <laughs> I believed in the story that much. And Harry Evans was running Random House at that time. And she said, we'll do it as a novel. But I'm telling you one thing right now. We're not going to try to fool Harry. Because Harry didn't take that kind of joke well at all. Harry was a very, very, um, let's just say, he did not like to be, he didn't like, like his intellect to be toyed with. Mm. Um, so they bought it, um, and I did it, you know, and now it's going to be, um, just to kind of wrap up the alienists, then I want to get to surrender. Now TNT is turning it into a television series or a special? TNT or? is supposedly turning it into a television series. Tw 20 I, years later? I can't tell you anything about it because they have not said a word to me, huh. which amazes me. But um, I What's the economics of that? You just sold them the rights and they did their, they're doing their They thing? already had the rights from 20 years ago. Scott okay. Rudin bought the rights 20 years ago for a movie. Um, I was a thorn in his side, stopped him from making about 10 different awful versions of scripts of The Alienist, found ways to stop him. He was infuriated about it. Um, hasn't spoken to me since. Mm. Um, but they still owned the rights, Paramount. So when they formed a new TV division, they started looking at all the stuff they owned at Paramount. And they said, well, nobody's done this yet. So they decided to do a TV show. Um, and Carrie Fukunaga, turned out, had been a big fan of the show, wanted to wanted to direct it, and it turned out right. It. Um, so I was basically, although I was supposed to be a consultant, I was never consulted. I was, I was never consulted. <laughs> I was given a I was given a dinner at the downtown Delmonico's, which if they had consulted me, I would have told them. Although it's been nicely. Uh, renovated because of the alienness, because so many people go there now because of that book. Yeah. They made enough money to renovate the place, but it's still a lousy restaurant. Um, and I would have told them that. You know, everybody was talking about how lousy the food was. <laughs> so um, it really, um, I don't know anything about it. Well, so, okay, so fast forwarding, you did a bunch of, uh, best-selling novels. You also did a lot of nonfiction books about military history, terrorism. You've done a ton of essays. I recommend people read all of them, actually, because they're all so intelligent. But I do want to get to Surrender New York. Why now? Why is this? After all these books, 10 other books, five other novels or four other novels, whatever it is, uh, why now the first time you're doing a contemporary thriller set in modern Two times? Reasons. You've done future, you've done past, yes. you haven't done now. Two reasons. Um, I reached a point in my life where I wanted to write something. I did want to write something that would give people really close insight into my life without it being blatant. I wanted to return to that idea, get a little closer than the, than the Alienist books did. Um, and also... The two new, I'm now going to do two more Alienist books. Right, a, pre, uh, a sequel and a prequel, right? A sequel and a prequel, right. And they're both going to be told by Kreitzler. And, uh, which is different than the Alienist and Angel of Darkness. Right. And I needed to find a way to speak in the voice of the man, the, the you know, what's always considered the man behind the curtain and these things like Sherlock Holmes, Conan Doyle wrote one story told by Sherlock Holmes, terrible failure. Mm. But Sherlock Holmes is Chrysler's very different character. Um, 
I wanted to find a way to speak in that about these matters, about all the things we've been discussing, these psychological matters um, and personal matters, in a way that was would make people comfortable, would make people um, so it didn't sound like a case file, so it didn't sound like a scientific study, um, so it gave you insight into the character because. You know, people really are fascinated by Chrysler. They want to know what what gives with this guy. And just to be clear, he's he's the uh, psychological or psychologist who's like sort of the profiler of these serial killers in the book. Sure, in the Alienist. And he the is the Rogers. Alienist, right? Right. He, he is the Alienist, and he's almost a he is almost a Sherlockian type. Mm-hmm. Character that he is the Sherlock Holmes of of these books. Not to make the direct comparison, but with with a much more human dimension, right? Because Sherlock Holmes was like a computer. Yes, exactly. Sherlock Holmes' great statement was, I don't need to know any about anybody involved in a case. Just show me the evidence. And by the way, just to again underline what an expert you are on these things, you did write a Sherlock Holmes novel commissioned by the Sherlock Holmes or the Art Sir Arthur Conan Doyle estate. I did. I did. Um, that turned out very well. Um, thank God, because I don't know what I would have done if it hadn't, because well, the... the um, the the legal representative for the estate in the United States um, happens to be a good friend of mine who was was a career Pentagon official, mm-hmm. and he asked me to do something, and I what did he ask you to do? <laughs> he asked me to write a story. Okay, you know. And I, uh, it quickly became apparent that the story was turning into a novel. And um, I said, I'm sorry that it's not going to be a story. It's going to be a whole novel. He said, that's fine. <laughs> you know, that's, that's good, too. Um, but it all turned out very well in the end. Um, and I was very happy for that. So, so, and now with Surrender New York, like you said, you're, 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 you're alienist, so to speak, is is you you're starting to find that voice? You you basically found that voice within Surrender New York. Well, and it was important in that connection. He's he's the contemporary guy, the narrator Trajan Jones of of Surrender, is the contemporary expert on Kreitzler. Right, that's his special area of study. So, um, and he applies those same methods to today. To solving cases today, in addition to other stuff, but but he tries to apply those same lessons to today, and it's amazing how many of them are still applicable, applicable and and useful. And how does that come into play with the rise of again DNA testing, traditional forensic analysis, or now what's traditional, like and, and all the pros and cons of of using those methods in investigating a serial killer? Well. This is where we get back to this idea of criminal science versus forensic science. Um, they, he, and his partner in the book are were are were advisors to the city police department for years, and but they insisted on keep their independence as advisors because they believe in criminal science. They don't. They will not go straight for, you know, okay, who's the favored suspect? Who who you know, who do we like, as they say in this case. They want to follow, follow the, they want to do what criminal science should do, which if it were independent still, it would do, which is simply follow the evidence and let it lead you to the person. Don't, don't have somebody that you like in mind and then make, which is all too often what happens now with forensic science, Every lab, every including the lab in Quantico, the one that's in Silence of the Lambs, has had huge scandals over the last 20 years because they're forcing evidence to fit, you know, particular suspects. So let me try to understand that. So let's say I, I like a suspect. Mm-hmm. Does that mean I'm going to try to find, you know, blood that matches the DNA of that suspect when it's there may called, be many reasons called, why there might be blood there or whatever? It's called cognitive bias. And the thing that people forget about, even DNA, although DNA is, you know, much, much more reliable, but fingerprinting, ballistics, any of the stuff, 
you know, trace evidence. It all depends on who collects and analyzes it. There are a lot of people who are very good at it. There are a lot of people who are really bad at it. The people who are really good at it take a long time. The people who are really bad at it can do it. Will do it very quickly. Really, I, I always thought it was just like you put it in a machine, pop. It's that's this person's because DNA. You, that's because you know one of the big points in the book is everybody's getting their ideas from everybody's getting their ideas from. Uh, from shows like CSI, you know, where everything happens, everything, you magically put it in these machines which don't exist. You know, fingerprints go, or faces go into these machines that and, you know, within five seconds they've got a match. It, it doesn't work that way. Uh, there's a woman uh, I met who's a, 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 a trace evidence analyzer out in Queens where the New York City Crime Lab is. She did hair analysis on a uh, car that was involved in a police killing. It took her two years to completely analyze the car. Mm. She's very good. Um, somebody else, however, who's a little more ambitious, a little more corrupt, he might find you the evidence you want very quickly. So, like, let's take a classic case, like, you know, the what you've written about, actually, the John Vinay Ramsey case where, mm -hmm. you know, a six-year-old kind of beauty contestant uh, was was killed. Her parents were suspect. Her brother was suspect. The neighbors were suspect. Nobody ever was found to be guilty. But right away, it seemed, DNA ruled out the parents. What do you... Now, it's funny you mention that case because um, I wrote about it at the one-year anniversary the Times would like to see something from me for the, we're about to get, hit the 10-year anniversary. Mm. Still no solution. There'll never be a solution, really, um, because everybody's dead. Um, but but uh, I went, after I wrote the piece for the Times and explained why, you know, all the things that had gone wrong, all the prejudicial things that had happened, in favor of this very wealthy man in Colorado who, you know, was her father to protect him, all of these kind of extremely dubious things. Um, I went, I was invited to go to, to John Jay College and teach a, uh, a guest seminar in their master class in uh, criminal profiling. And we, t and, and we talked about the methods in the alienist and how relevant they still were today. And they were a very smart group of kids, really smart. Uh, John Jay does not get enough credit for how many for how many good um, people on that level. It turns out people tend to associate it in the popular mind with you know they crank out prison guards and people like that, but they turn out a lot of really smart criminal scientists. And um, they, these were all graduate students. And I said, let's let's apply this what we've been talking about. Kreitzer's method. Let's apply it to a recent case, say John Benet Ramsey. So we spent hours um, doing exactly what they do in the book, using the chalkboard, putting up every clue that we knew about, all pieces of evidence we knew about, theories, eliminating theories, going through it, going through it, and without any guidance from me, they eventually reached the conclusion that was the conclusion I believed was true. Which was what? Which was always pretty gratifying. Um, I think it was a tragic series of events that involved the entire family. Hmm. Um, that every everyone in the family was involved in a different step of either accidental or long term abuse of this kid. And um, what well, what made you think long term abuse? There was evidence that she had been sexually molested. There was never any evidence that a stranger had gotten into the house. There was simply evidence that she had been, for want of a better word, penetrated by an adult male. Um, at least digitally, and I don't want to get too graphic for people, but at least digitally and probably, um, you know, 
penile. So, so I bring this all up because uh, this does, I think you're right, in this kind of CSI world, we do think, oh, we think it's here, magic. Here's the samples of hair, and, blood, And the DNA. problem is this is now, this has now completely corrupted our judicial system because juries want to, they want to hear, they don't even listen to eyewitnesses anymore. There have been a few spectacular cases that have been dismissed, that have been gone the wrong way. There was a case of a of a priest who was murdered. I forget exactly where, somewhere in New York. Um, there were a couple of kids who witnessed it, who were in the church at the time. He was robbed and murdered. They hid while they, while it was all happening. They brought the kids in. They had the suspects. They brought the kids in, and the kid said, "Those are the guys we saw." Um, I think they were altar boys or, or something, um, but old enough to know what they were saying. But the jury refused to convict because they said, there's no CSI. Where's the forensics? Hmm. Where's, where's all the stuff we see on TV? And that's what all, juries are saying that all the time now. And so That's all it, they're interested in. So this is like a societal problem because obviously we it's need... It's a huge... Societal we need problem. to convict, find and convict criminals. If you find, if you find, if you talk to the guys at Northwestern who are trying to get guys out of off a of death row, they'll tell you, you know, that 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 it is hugely expensive to bring in private uh, forensic scientists to speak for defendants, but the state's got them all lined up working for them. And in a sense, this is the crux of Surrender New York, which is this kind of almost uh, battle that's happening in criminology, in, in criminal or forensic science, this idea of like, how can we get back to traditional methods? Here you have a potentially serial killer on the loose. Uh, there's young boys uh, being... And girls. G- being killed. And you, you use an interesting phrase, which I had never heard before in the book, that these are throwaway kids, uh, that they're... Kids that were somehow unwanted by their parents, so they're sort of out there. Either they're 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 they're, they're simply their parents, their family simply disappeared. This is a new thing. I had not expected to find this. It came on me as a surprise. I was doing my research, and I kept coming on in 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 documents from the uh, Office of of Child and Family Services. Um, I kept coming on this term, throwaway children. Now I'd seen thrown away. Thrown away is just another word for runaways. Uh, basically, I mean, it's a word for kids that have been kicked out of their house. But these are kids, these throwaway kids. It's a whole new class. It's kids who wake up one morning and the family's just gone. And like they, they wake up. They, and they, they may no- they may leave them a credit card. They may leave them some money, um, but they just disappear and nobody finds them. They did. They they often go out west if they're here. They often go out west and just disappear into the void, go off the grid, or or change their names. Nobody knows what happens to them. But here we have this whole new class of, you know, it's not really a class of kids yet, but a group of kids now who now the system's working against them because they can't go back to school. You can't go back to school unless you have a family to, to, to you know, home. Um, you can't work. You're too young to work to get your working papers. Um, you can't, the only thing that's left to you is the one thing that no homeless kid wants to do, which is to go into the foster program because everybody knows that the foster program now is so corrupt that it's basically, you know, it's a, it's a money-making scheme. Um, there's a few exceptions and I don't mean to insult the people who are exceptions, but by and large, the foster care system is a mess. Our child care system in New York State is a mess. Um, and it was one of the things that Andrew Cuomo was supposed to reform, one of the many things that he did not reform. And uh, one of the reasons why many of us would like to see him convicted of corruption because he has failed mm-hmm. on so many levels. Um, and this is one of the most glaring and so, but you know, I kind of see though a parallel between these throwaway kids and again, what you went through as a child. I mean, your father was in and out of your life and abusive. And then his father, well, he was essentially not quite a throwaway kid, but he grew up with his grandparents, your your father, correct? 
No, he grew up as a, with his mother. I but, thought uh, at some point his parents divorced and he spent some time in St. Louis. No, but and, his father did just disappear. It's true. He just he woke up one morning. His father ran away with his and his sister's governess. Hmm. Just disappeared out west. Became a, turned out. Never saw him again until the man was in his coffin. Hmm. Um, turned out he had been all those years a sheep herder in Colorado. I mean, did that parallel, uh, were you thinking to the forefront of your head when you were writing the book that this parallel between your father's life, your life, and the lives of these kids who were killed in the book? It's not in the forefront of your head, but by now it's no longer in the forefront of my head. Now it's my in my, to use <laughs> for want of a better phrase, it's in my DNA. It's just, it's in everything that I do, fiction-wise. Mm. Um you know, the last book I wrote was a was a was a was a medieval novel, and it was about abuse, the abuse of children. Um, it's 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 in everything that I do. It motivates everything I do because that's the only place we're going to stop it. That's the the all of these cycles, all the all of these abusive things are cyclical, are syndromes. They get passed on from generation to generation, and the only way we're going to stop it is to get it in childhood to help these kids in childhood and they're just not getting the help that they need my father did not get the help he needed um you know i didn't get the help i needed it's it's one of the reasons i never had children myself because i was determined that it was going to end with me mm. you know because i knew that my father's sickness um that he, and he said it to me. But but don't you think awareness, like given your level of awareness of this, don't you think if you had children, you would have been able to kind of hold yourself back to some extent? I simply could not. I simply could not trust that. Mm -hmm. I simply could not trust that. Has that bit hurt relationships you've been in where maybe mm -hmm. the other side wanted to have children and then because mm -hmm. you couldn't, it ended? Mm-hmm. It has. But it didn't matter to me. Um, you know, I explained to them very carefully that it was not going to happen. I didn't really know why early on, but I always said it's just not going to happen with me. Um, and people always said to me, you know, my brother who's got four kids, my older brother's four, got four kids, my younger brother's got one. My older brother always said to me, yeah, 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 you say that now, but wait till you have them. You'll, you, you know, it'll all be different. I said it's not going to happen. Do you, do your brothers who have kids? Do do they? Do you see the cycle? But they continue? weren't. But they no, because you were the one target. of the classic. One of the classic things about abusers is they pick one. Hmm. They pick one kid to abuse. Hmm. Um, and my father unfortunately picked me. So now, so now you're able to kind of take it into this contemporary world of Surrender, New York. The town is called Surrender, by the way. So Surrender, comma New York is the is is the book, and uh, which is a great name for a town. It reminds me of this is a town called Defiance, Ohio, right? Which I love that kind of name as well. But so Surrender, New York, and there's the Kreitzer like you know Sherlockian alienist like character who's the storyteller, and there's the um, the the kids. There's the there's the is this a serial killer? There's the whole discussion. Where do you see the the battle between traditional and uh, modern taking place? Well, in that's the, book? the that's the importance of it. his partner is a trace evidence expert, and that's important because I don't want to deny that science has its role. That the that the scientific advances of the last century have their role in in criminal science, but. You, they only have a role if we can keep them independent. And that's his partner's big lesson. They both teach classes online for SUNY Albany. And um, that's, that's the big lesson that, he, that, that, that his partner tries to teach is independence. You've got, if you want to be a good criminal scientist in the scientist sense... You cannot allow yourself, again, returning to that phrase, be prostituted to the prosecution. You can't um, sell out, basically. Hard to do, really hard to do, because that's that's where a lot of their jobs are. Uh, and I guess also all of their paychecks come from the same place. Well, not all of them. You can go independent. Right, but I mean, the, the guy working in the forensics lab at the police station is getting his paycheck from the same government that the prosecutor's getting. Oh, yeah. 
Of course, and that's the that's the whole point. And they're in the same system, so if they want to advance, they've got to please their superiors, and their superiors are the cops, the district attorneys. These are the these you know those are the people you got to please, and there's only one thing those people are interested in because they all want to advance too. Convictions, convictions, convictions. And I think that's what makes a book like yours so interesting is because there's conflict on so many layers. There's, you know, government versus independent. There's obviously a killer versus uh, investigators. There's public versus private. There's, you know, and and again, there's the, of course, gross horror of what's actually happening and we want to solve this. And, you know, it, again, it's a modern Sherlock Holmes, but with all this added... Mm-hmm. Uh, technology and issues and and layers and layers and layers, which I think makes it multiple cliffhangers. Did you find again that the characters sort of drove the story as you were writing this, particularly with this new way of trying out voices? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I found it. I find it. I find it easier and easier to work with the characters as I get older. Um, it's not that I control them. I would never but, say. But that. I would say this character was more like you, also. Um, he's probably he's probably as close as I will ever get to to me uh, in terms of a fictional character. Yeah, um, but in especially in terms of a lot of people have objected to, for instance, <laughs> he has an easy time from going from being eloquent to being, you know, he. He grew up in New York. He grew up in New York. You can throw a lot of salty language around. And he does. So um, it's it's uh, people who don't get that just didn't grow up in New York or don't know anything about New York and certainly don't know anything about New York law enforcement, um, where where the F word is is virtually the only word employed. <laughs> I mean, given what you know about all this, has, has any police department ever reached out to you for consulting help? No. No. I um, I did get an invitation to speak, to be the keynote speaker once at the annual conference of the American Psychiatric Association. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was kind of laughing when I got the invitation, I called them up and I said, listen, I'm very honored, but you guys do know I'm not a doctor, right? And the guy, there was a long pause, and the guy said, oh, we just kind of assumed based on your level of knowledge of all this stuff. And I said, no, no, it's an understandable mistake. I understand if you want to withdraw the invitation. They said, well, we really kind of have to. And I said, that's fine. It was It was nice to know that, you know, that's funny. I'm not a doctor, but I could play one on <laughs> on TV on a, in a conference of professionals. <laughs> Let me ask you this: you you talked about how there's only a few degrees separating, let's say, the the psychologist from the serial killer, and of course, we know you're you're kind of basing all of these things on your own experience and history. Would you consider yourself, um, and given that there's a spectrum of this, and Forgive me for the question, but would you consider yourself having sociopathic tendencies, maybe functional sociopathic tendencies? Um, no, not sociopathic tendencies. I do think I have. I do think I have a certain level, certain levels of, um, what in what in the days when of the books that I read about, they would call intense melancholia um which involves you know it's not really depression it's um it's 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 a dark it's a dark dark place you go and but i've learned to use it you know i found a way to use it are you able to function with it like yeah oh yeah that's when i work Hmm. you know that's that's like i say to people i don't make this stuff up you know, this is coming out of my life, and it's coming out of, you know, the horrible stuff that I write about. Most of it, people say, how can you think of all these awful things? I'm like, virtually all of them are from newspaper stories, whether the newspaper stories of the past or or today. So that, that reality probably resonates in a weird way. It, it resonates in a deep way with me, and I feel I have to represent. So, so... Let's say someone out there is is listening to this. Obviously, they're going to be interested in reading Surrender New York. But let's say someone wants to also learn more about 
how to write a thriller or or do what you do. What are some some books or other thing references that you would recommend? What what should people know? Oh boy. Um know that it is uh, it's going to involve a lot of research. It's going to involve a lot of footwork. It's going to involve a lot of um going to places that you never knew existed like what? in terms of research. Well, like like um Archives that you never knew existed. Well, th- th- this country's full of information, old and new, um, and you've got to get it. You've got to go and get it. It's you can't just make this stuff up. The great ones don't just make this stuff up. That's, you know, that's fascinating, actually. Yeah, no, it's true. You have to like learning. The one thing that I would say that always saves me in any situation is the one thing I am addicted to is learning. I love learning, and one of the reasons my books are so detailed is because I find out things, details, from research, and I think, God, that's fascinating. And I think, no, the American public is not too stupid to find that fascinating, too. I'm going to share it. Well, what's the most fascinating thing you found in Surrender, New York? Other than the throwaway kids, which was a huge one. Um, oh God, there's a lot. Um, it would be it would be tough to pick. It would be tough to pick another one right off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I'd have to think about that for a second. What would be a really What would be a really good one? The other thing is, you've got to disguise. You you can't set out surrender addresses a lot of social issues don't address them directly right they don't have they uh, must be organic to the plot like there is a there is an incident in in surrender where a young black man is shot a couple of dozen times by a lot of police when he shouldn't have been wasn't carrying a weapon and the psychologist is trying to save him. And, um, but it's not presented as, and here's another incident of a young black man shot down by police unjustly. It's part of the story. You know, you, you can draw that. The audience is smart enough to draw the conclusion of what's happening in this society themselves. They'll, they'll get that. They don't need to be told. Um, don't people don't hit people over the head with stuff, you know. Trust your audience. Um, I know that's I know that's a very strange thing to suggest right now in the age we're living in. Well, but the showing not telling is classic advice for for writers. It's well, always better to show. But we're showing such dumb stuff so much of the time right now. <laughs> um, it's uh it's and people really do have less reading time because they're spending so much time at the computer you know the reading is is tough for a lot of people to fit in but it, it's so funny we haven't talked about it it's almost worthy of another podcast but your book killing time is right. all about the relationship between inf- too much in- a glut of information and actual wisdom yeah. So uh, I I recommend people read that book as well. Well, information is not knowledge was the was the key phrase of that of that book and um I'm sorry to say it raised a lot of hackles when it was published, but to this point you know, it was predicting events in I think 2023. Yes. Virtually everything that so far that it predicted has happened. And happen right on schedule. And if more, any more of it happens, we are seriously screwed. <laughs> well, Caleb, thanks so much, Caleb Carr, for coming on my podcast. Surrender New York just came out. Great book. I highly recommend everybody read it. I'm such a big fan of all of your thrillers and your knowledge that you've been able to share here. So. I'm really grateful you came on the show. I really appreciate it. James, it was an absolute pleasure. I'm delighted to be here with you. Thanks. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, thanks for listening. Listen. 
I have a big favor to ask you, and it will only take 30 seconds or less, and it would mean a huge amount to me. If you like this podcast, please let me know. Please let the team I work with know. Please let my guests know, and you can do this easily by subscribing to the podcast. It's probably the biggest favor you could do for me right now, and it's really simple. Just go to iTunes, search for The James Altucher Show, and click subscribe. Again, it will only take you 30 seconds or less. And if you subscribe now, it will really help me out a lot. Thanks again. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.